Grind is a reason to come back to games. Grind is something to do other than just beating the story of a game. Grind is a way that games can have more playtime without requiring developers to put too many extra hours in to make extra content for the base game. Grinding isn't just something you are forced to do in a game to get past a barrier. It can be so much more. Grind and video games have been connected for years. Ever since games were created, they've had some form of grind. Even arcades way back then had high scores, and some committed players wanted to pursue being the best in their area at a game. Years later, when video games became a little more mainstream and home consoles were created, Grind adapted. Dragon Quest, released in 1986, was one of the first games that required players to grind levels in order to get through the game or at least make it easier to do so. Over time, game developers and players figured out ways to make games last longer in various ways. The two most prominent examples of this are difficulty and grind. Difficulty in gaming has been a relatively hot topic in recent years, and rightfully so. Early on in gaming's life cycle, difficulty was used to arbitrarily increase playtime as storage was a problem for early gaming systems. Take Crash Bandicoot, for example. Released in 1996, this game was one of the original difficulty games, and became a cult classic for both its difficulty and charm. It's a quick game if you're good at it, but requires a decent learning curve. The same thing can be said for the ambiguity of some games. In a time before guides and large internet presence in the gaming community, games would be more difficult to beat just because people didn't know how to beat them. Ambiguity in games can increase playtime. I mean, look at RPGs like Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy. These games might take hours longer for some players if they couldn't use a guide. However, over time, as storage became less of an issue, most developers dropped the whole impossible to beat so we get more playtime out of it shtick, and picked up investing more resources and data into making the games longer and more replayable without needing to turn the difficulty up to 11. This eventually led to difficulty being used differently in gaming, as opposed to just being another way to increase playtime. As for ambiguity, developers can't rely on it as much anymore due to gaming's larger online presence now, but that's a whole other story. Released a couple of months before Crash Bandicoot in 1996, Super Mario 64 was released, paving the way for a new subgenre of game, the Collectathon. Although somewhat short lived in the mainstream, Collectathons made a large impact in gaming, such as the aforementioned Super Mario 64, as well as Banjo Kazooie and Spyro the Dragon, which released two years to the date after Crash Bandicoot. This isn't really relevant, but my birthday is also that day, so enjoy that fun fact, I guess. Collectathons provided fun, relaxing gameplay while also letting the player work towards something other than just beating the main story. Once players beat the main story, they could still wrap up the game if they wanted to and complete 100% of the content and reap whatever rewards come out of it, such as extra developer content, a secret ending, or just feelings of fulfillment, even if that's lackluster to some. Around the time of the introduction of collectathons, massively multiplayer online role-playing games emerged, MMORPGs for short. Now I haven't played any MMORPGs for any decent amount of time, but I know that they are grind-centric games focusing on creating a world where other players invest time to get resources and grow their character within a world of other players' characters. MMORPGs are essentially just live service games meant to encourage grind while playing with friends and other people online. Like most topics about the gaming space, speedrunning deserves some limelight in the conversation. It seems everything in gaming nowadays can translate into speedrunning in some way, shape, or form, and grind is no exception. Now, why is speedrunning relevant to grind? Isn't it just beating the game fast? Well, speedrunning is one of the more interesting developments of grind in gaming. Speedrunning, as far as I know, is the only form of grind that's solely created by the players themselves. I wouldn't count high scores and leaderboards in arcade games just because they're internal to the game itself, so I'd still say that it's developer-created grind. So, to clarify, I'd classify speedrunning as grind, because speedrunners devote many playthroughs of a game to improve their time. Sometimes the dedication of these players is absolutely mind-blowing. Some speedrunners have over thousands of completions of one game under their belt just for practice. I mean, it makes sense. You know what they say. Spending 10,000 hours practicing a skill leads to mastery. 
and 10,000 hours is a huge feat when it comes to active playtime out of a single game. Speaking of lots of playtime invested into one game, achievements, trophies, or whatever you want to call them were introduced into mainstream gaming in 2005 on the Xbox 360. Over the next few years, this platform-based reward system became a staple of most gaming systems, looking at you, Nintendo. Valve added achievement support to games in 2007, and Sony added trophies to PlayStation 3 in 2008. Addition of achievements created another social aspect of gaming on these networks. Players now had the ability to show off their achievements in some of their favorite games. Xbox had gamer score, PlayStation had platinum trophies, and account level, while Steam had profile customization. Of course, achievements are optional and not all players care to grind them out, which is understandable. Now, I could go on for ages about achievements or trophies and my thoughts on them. I mean, that's sort of what got me into grind and also how I decided on my username. But that's not what this video is about. It's about modern grind and the problems behind it. So one last form of grind before I start my rant about modern grind and its flaws. And I promise this one is the most relevant. Unlockables in multiplayer titles such as older Call of Duty games put an emphasis on playing the game to earn rewards that are available when the game launches. If any of you have played any Call of Duty titles between Modern Warfare 2, the original 2009 one, and Black Ops 3, you'll likely know what I'm talking about. Calling cards, although purely cosmetic, are unlockables that players may desire to grind out and earn over their time playing the game. Along with calling cards, this era of Call of Duty games brought emblems and camos with it. More customization options could be earned by players for hard work, dedication, skill, or even playtime. Unlockable content was not time-locked, and when the main game or a DLC was released, players would be able to access all of the content, including cosmetics, regardless of if they played the game on launch or 10 years later. During this time in gaming, publishers and developers seemed to keep the mindset of releasing finished products, and not abusing their ability to patch content after release. Well, too much, that is. In the current era of live service games, which I'd argue are titles released after 2018, the Battle Pass trend began, and content now started to come out in different ways. Games would now receive updates over time, giving everyone access to content for no premium price. Kind of. You see, for the most part, in online-only games, Gone were the days of purchasing a season pass on the game's release to gain access to future DLCs, which you might not even know about at the moment. Gone were the days of paying for extra stuff that may come to the game once you stop playing it. Gone were the days of paying for more content to not be separated from friends and other players who did not own it. Anyone remember map packs from Call of Duty? It wasn't a consumer-friendly system. Games that followed this new free content model didn't lock out players who couldn't afford all of the game's map packs. However, publishers and developers started outputting battle passes. Battle passes are a time-based monetization method that is mostly advanced by playtime and, in some cases, assisted by completing in-game challenges. Battle passes contain unique time-based unlocks that are, for the most part, completely cosmetic. Battle passes offer a free and paid track with varying rewards based off of the track and how far you've progressed in the pass. Normally, games let the user pay to advance the pass without having to play the game. As opposed to the hated statement, pay to win, this method can be more pay to earn, or pay to avoid earning, or just buying cosmetics with extra steps, I guess. From a perspective of consumer-friendly practices, this monetization method is admittedly the best in mainstream games that the industry has had in a while. But battle passes come with a fairly large drawback. In my opinion, the grind that battle passes bring with them is mediocre at best. Most battle passes progress off of active playtime. Call of Duty's battle passes do this for example, but this method often doesn't communicate how much the player needs to play to advance the pass. Early levels may take half an hour, when the final levels could take over an hour. Other games' passes provide extra challenges to the player to grind out per season. For example, Dead by Daylight's Rift does this in a great way, in my opinion. Every few weeks, a new set of challenges are added to which players can advance the rift by completing said challenges. 
even though this is a good way of making progression in a battle pass more tangible and active, it doesn't fix the issues of earning cosmetics from this new type of system. Many battle passes are filled with tons of bloatware. No one in the right mind wants a quarter of the tiers in a pass to reward them with charms. Charms that no one will use, charms that everyone has, and charms that can only be equipped one at a time. Even cooler cosmetic rewards in a battle pass, such as unique skins, customizations, and the like, lose their bragging rights. Reaching the final tier of a battle pass is a time investment for sure, but everyone can reach that point, regardless of skill or challenges completed in most games. In the past, unique cosmetics were unlocked through more respectable and purposeful grinding. Cosmetics that have more bragging rights than just I put hundreds of hours into this game within three months. A specific three months at that. It's rare in battle passes to do a challenge and be awarded a cosmetic for doing that challenge alone. And as far as I know, no battle pass does this. According to battle passes, it doesn't matter what you do in game as long as you're playing it. Battle passes, in concept, rarely encourage different playstyles in a game. They only really encourage general playtime which can, after a while, start to get monotonous with nothing interesting to grind. Likewise, they are extremely unlikely to ever give rewards based on completing specific challenges on their own. This is one thing I have missed in mainstream multiplayer games for the past few years. I can't look at cool cosmetics in more recent games and grind for them at my own pace. Instead, I need to reach whatever tier the battle pass, or whatever it's called, within however many days all while collecting items that I simply do not care about to reach a cosmetic that everyone else can get with enough time or money invested, as long as it's within the time frame that the developers specified. This whole inclusive but time-limited reward system only provides rewards that don't feel earned. These end-of-battle pass cosmetics may actually look better than certain extremely grindy completion type cosmetics, but in my opinion, if a cosmetic you spent a ton of time and effort grinding is not as cool as a final battle pass tier cosmetic, then that discourages players to put effort in to grind difficult unlocks and just settle for the not as earned, but better looking cosmetics that many players already have. The main purpose of a battle pass is to raise time of players who enjoy the game by creating an artificial time-based grind system, but sometimes this system can just burn the player out by pushing them to always play the same game, just to get a reward that probably isn't worth it. I've definitely fallen for this trap. Both Dead by Daylight and recent Call of Duties have burnt me out mostly due to the fact that I felt forced to play the game a certain amount of hours a day on average. It's weird that a system designed to make you want to keep playing can push you away from the game just as easily. Sure, before the system, games had timed events and exclusive cosmetic rewards from said events, but that was far less often and not running throughout the entire year and, well, lifespan of the game. With the Battle Pass system, as is, in several games, players never really have a chance to take a long break from a game without permanently missing some rewards. In all honesty, that's literally the definition of FOMO, or fear of missing out. And with so many live service games today, no one has enough time to unlock everything. The battle pass system is more inclusive for less skilled players, but people with less time outside of gaming, no matter how skilled they are, are excluded from awards for being too busy. I mean, sure they could buy progress in a pass in most games, but honestly, where's the fun in that? Games that rely on stores or passes for their only form of content and cosmetics hurt their players who are completionists. Battle passes are a completionist's worst nightmare, especially if they start playing a game late or play multiple live service games at a time. Now, I haven't really talked about this much, but it needs to be said. The battle pass system is mostly better than previous cosmetic unlocking systems. Remember when loot boxes were a thing? Yeah, they were more fun than progressing in a battle pass, but random rewards aren't good for the consumer, especially when these rewards can provide an advantage. That system is straight up gambling. 
The battle pass system exists because other monetary systems were tiresome, misleading, scummy, and even outlawed. In hindsight, some loot box systems were better because they were earnable for free and were strictly cosmetic. Games just need some form of unlockables that aren't just in a store or are from the battle pass. Season passes, which tend to double the content in a game for around 70% of the price of the original game, are way less prevalent now. Games like Borderlands and other games with optional multiplayer still follow this model. You can even make the argument that some roguelike DLCs, such as Dead Cells or Binding of Isaac, are like season passes. Honestly, I'm completely fine with season passes being in these games, as fans get more content and devs can keep on making content and be able to profit. When season passes divide player bases, like with older Call of Duties and even Battlefield Premium, then it can be a problem, especially in friend groups. If four friends want one $15 map pack, that's a whole price tag of the game itself. This current era of post-launch content is great for gamers who don't want to pay more than a game's starting value. Hell, it's great for everyone. Developers and artists get more work and money adding content to the game and its battle pass every season. All players get gameplay-oriented content for free and at the same time as other gaming systems, along with cross-platform play for most titles. And the people who want to look good while playing can buy items in in-game store or the pass, all while knowing exactly what they're getting. But being a broken record and repeating myself, that doesn't mean this system is perfect. Again, quality of grind is low and usually doesn't encourage different gameplay styles. And for most passes, it doesn't even matter how players play the game. Developers just need to bring back challenges, in my opinion, and not rely solely on battle pass content for replayability, if you could even call it that. Requiring time commitment within a specific range of time inflates play numbers due to the amount of people playing the game for the sole purpose of progressing the pass. Grind should be a reason to play the game, to feel forward momentum. It should not be an arbitrary reason to play the game. Gamers should be able to play what they want without feeling an obligation to play because they have an active battle pass all year round. Seasonal events are fine, but having to spend full time grinding year round isn't, and this shouldn't be a trend. If you're getting burnt out in a game grinding its battle pass, try and not fall for the FOMO trap. Instead, think dice. Do I care enough? I hope you enjoyed the video. I spent some time making it. You might be able to tell by the date of my last video that I've been gone for a while, but I should be back now that I'm caught up with some other projects that took a ton of, well, grinding. But yeah, I'm gonna try to make more video essays because I enjoy talking about games and whatnot. And hey, if you enjoy listening to me talk about games and the like, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. I'm told it helps out. If you're disappointed in a friend for spending too much money on battle passes and cosmetics, share this video with them as well. Maybe someone can convince them to stop buying V-Bucks. I'm sure their wallet will thank you for it.